We're going to be spending our time here continuing in our Gospel of Matthew series. So as we begin today, um, we'll, I'll just read the text, and if you have it on your phone, you can follow along you know, with you, or uh, if you have a Bible, even better, all right? But I'll be referring to the text a number of times, so um, grab your Bibles and hang on. Okay. Let's begin with the, with the reading today. This is about Jesus. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him saying, my daughter has just died, but come, lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with uh, his disciples. Behold, a, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I'll be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl's not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And a report of this went throughout all of the district. You know, uh, you know as, a, as a pastor, I, uh, I can really relate to this text as um, I, I see the world in a very different way than most people do. You know, sometimes when People find out I'm a pastor, you know, they're not quite sure what to make of me or what to do, or, you know, or they ask me, so kind of, what's, what's, what's your job like? And sometimes I almost think, like, how, how do you explain to somebody? It's be like asking a soldier who's served in Iraq and seen war, you know, what's war like and give me three examples, you know, like, how do I even begin to explain to you the things that I see as a pastor? It's so different from my previous life as an engineer. I remember speaking with a, a group of Christian policemen once. And as we talked more, I realized that both of us uh, had something in common is that they felt like in society, they had a front row seat to human sin. And so do I often as a pastor. That is often what I see. But I, often, I don't just see sin. I see many of the good things as well, the blessings of God, the workings of God, you know, in, amongst our people and also in the world. But needless to say, I think that if you serve in Christian full-time ministry, whether you're a missionary, you're a church planter, or you've just been around in the church for a long time and you've taken a leadership position in the church, honestly, you can kind of relate to some of the things that I'm going to talk about. There is something, though, unique, I think, about the role of a pastor, just even in the makeup of it. You know, when other people are returning from work on Monday to Friday after their hard day and they're looking forward to dinner with their family, that's when my phone starts ringing. And there go my evenings as often I think about the people and I work on my emails, and when people are available and, you know, they want to talk as well, that's usually when uh, I, I can talk to people. You know, when other people are excited about hanging out on Saturdays with their families, I never am usually available on the Saturday. Saturday is a day which I retreat, actually, to my study far away. I lock myself away, and, um, and, and I pray, and I seek the Lord's face, and I prepare for my messages on, uh, for Sunday and deal with any other things that come up, you know, during the week as well that have to still be done. It's a really special time for me. Then on Sunday, when everyone is coming as well to hear the word of God and to be fed and to enjoy fellowship, I too also get to enjoy the, uh, the fellowship of God's, God's people. But I'm here preaching the word of God, speaking to people, counseling them, you know, and thinking about the people of God that have been entrusted to my care. On a regular basis, one of the things that I see probably more often than other people is um, when it comes to marriages, Usually as a pastor, whether I'm liked or not, I would have to be invited, you know, to a marriage. Um, but also when it comes to things like hospitals, uh, that's generally when people want me to visit. And usually I'll be one of the first who can get there as well to a hospital when someone has had an accident. I've seen everything, right? You know, from children who are crying over parents who've uh, just had a tragic motorcycle accident, those who have lost like a loved one, you know, um, and are not sure what to do. I'm usually the first one there as well at the family side as well as they begin planning for a funeral, you know, and they've never been through it before and they don't know what to do. They're grief stricken, they're tender, you know, from the loss and, and they just want to know, you know, a word from God, like how, how am I supposed to get through the day? This is so unexpected. We didn't, we didn't know that this was going to happen. 
I've seen, you know, in my short time already, you know, people bury, you know, the elderly, which many times was expected, which is still painful, but at least there's peace there. And then the, the, the hard ones are the children, you know, the same. Burying a little girl, you know, or, or going to the funeral, you know, of, a, of just a baby, you know, that's lived for 30 minutes, you know, outside the womb, but doesn't have all of her internal organs, you know, formed, and, and, that, and, and she passes, you know, into eternity. I see all of those things. I, you know, I, I look at all of that, and despite the emotional trials of it and the pain and stuff like that, it really is, I think, also a privilege. It's a privilege as well to suffer alongside the people of God, but also, I think, to be treated to a very, very special window, an avenue into this world that always reminds me, as I look at human suffering and pain in this world, that this world really is not all that there is. And I'm so often reminded that I'm a citizen, actually, of another world. I belong to Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. This world is not my home, and I am on my way, passing through this place, shepherding God's people as well to join me as well in this place, the heavenly city, the new Zion. You know, all these things, you know, as I think about what I say to people in the midst of their pain, especially as they walk through the, uh, the valley of the shadow of death when it comes to funerals, I do have to say something that, you know, um, that's always resonated with me throughout the years. And that is, I, I've, I've always echoed with Charles Spurgeon, who wrote about funerals and his pastoral ministry. I love his lectures to my students and many of his writings. And one of the things that Spurgeon noted, he said, was uh, that he actually um, loved uh, he found inf- more, infinitely more joy, he said, at funerals, in seeing saints die than he did at weddings. Now, that seems rather dark, right, or rather um, odd, you know, odd thing to say, but the more that actually I've lived that, the more that I found that actually to be true, that I too have found actually infinitely more joy at the bedside of Christians who are dying than I have had at weddings. I remember all of my funerals, but uh, to be honest, I find it, I struggle to remember honestly the events of, of, of weddings. There is something precious about seeing God's saints pass into eternity. Just as the scriptures say, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints as they go to be with him. You know, death for us as Christians is the Father God welcoming his children into their eternal home, the place that he said he has gone to prepare for them, that the place that he has labored over to make a place for them for all of eternity. Death is the passage actually from life into greater resurrection life for us as Christians. You know, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verses 2 to 4 is actually one of my favorite verses, and it reads this way. It is better to go to the house of mourning than it is to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of the face, the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. The heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Now, just to be clear here, this verse isn't saying that if you like parties or wedding feasts, you're a fool, okay? I mean, it's not meant to say that anytime you're having a good time, you're an idiot, okay? Uh, Rather, what it's saying that is, it's, it's giving a proverbial statement to say that, look, if you really want to gain wisdom to know how to live life, A single hour spent at a funeral, spent at the bedside of somebody who is dying, is way better than an entire eight hours spent at a wedding party. See, not everybody is going to get married in this life, but I guarantee you this, everyone is going to die one day. And so when you see that actually face to face, you'll be well served as you think about the nature of your own mortality and the brevity and shortness of your own life. And not only that, the creator who made you and gifted you this life and what you're currently doing with it. See, you can always learn lessons in the house of sorrow because one day you too will be in the house of sorrow. Now, when I talk with Canadians and I go out into our culture and I've spoken with students, people here on the North Shore, I find that one topic that people are, find most uncomfortable and unwilling to engage about is the subject of death. They get so uncomfortable that they just don't know what to do with it. Uh, generally speaking, I think people uh, th- try to push against it with t- one of two responses. One, they'll say, like, well, you know, I'm just so busy, you know, life is so busy, I just haven't really given much time to thinking about it, you know, so, or others will say, you know, I, honestly speaking, um, I- I'm just kind of scared of it, and I actually don't like to think about it, so can we, like, talk about something else, you know? And they try to do this in a rather sort of polite way, and you, you just know, like, you know, that they don't want don't, don't to talk about it. But I've always found this so odd, logically speaking. I mean, 
most of us, you know, uh, know how to go through high school or go through four years torturing ourselves over university exams for what? To get a piece of paper and then get a job. So it shows that we know how to think several years in the future saying, if I don't suffer now, I'm not going to get the job that I want, I won't have money, and then I'm not going to be able to pay for my family and so all these things. See, we know how to plan for five, ten years down the road. Furthermore, we know how to plan for 30 years down the road because people, I know many times, start investing in their RRSPs early on in life, 10, 20, or 30 years before they're actually going to retire at 65 or 70 or whatever the retirement age is right now. And yet, for some reason, when you ask them to think just a bit more, 50 years, 60 years, because you're going to be dead by then, have you given any thought to working on your eternal RRSPs? Have you given any thought to eternal estate planning whatsoever? Uh, absolutely, no. Not, no, never, never really thought much about it. So odd, given that North Americans have access to books, resources. You know, we have ample amounts of food and other things available to us. And yet, for some reason, we are the least equipped to deal with death and to think about these great issues of life. It's a strange, strange phenomenon. I suspect that, you know, because many people have a bleak, atheistic, materialistic worldview, the thought of wrestling through death is not only unpleasant, but I think there's this strange sense of trepidation as people are really worried about what they're going to find at the end on the other side. There's really not a lot to look forward to. So the thing you can do to deal with this, you try to block it out of your mind and just pretend that it doesn't exist. You know, I remember I've played hide and seek with um, children many times when I worked in children's ministry and I've played with my own kids. Funniest thing to watch is two-year-olds, right, who have not quite mastered the game of hide and go seek. And initially when they're learning how to play, they come up with this brilliant idea and that is they, they, they find some spot that they like and then they close their eyes and they put their hands over their eyes to make sure no light gets in and they say, I'm hiding, I'm hiding. And they're, they're thinking through that little brain of theirs, which is still learning how to process the world, that if I can't see you, it means you probably can't see me. So I have a great hiding spot. Now that doesn't last for very long because children quickly figure out afterwards, oh, just because I can't see you doesn't mean that you can't see me. And I feel that's what most people do with their lives. They look at death in the face and they think, well, let me just pull the blinders of my job, my busyness, and all these things. As long as I don't look at it, it probably can't find me. But I have to just say to you, you know, if that's, if that's you and you live in this culture, this is two-year-old type of thinking. Just because you refuse to look at death does not mean that death is not staring at you. And it's coming. It's coming for sure. And you have to know how to deal with it. You know, as Christians, as the text says in here, I think the heart can actually be made glad, that is, not fearful when it comes to thinking about death because we know that death is not disappearing into nothingness. Death is moving into the presence of the one who made us and who has called us into a relationship with himself. See, death forces us actually to tear our eyes away from the things of this world and to look upward to the heavens where Christ is and see the infinite joys of heaven, a relationship with God, a place in which we will never again know sickness, suffering, pain, or death. It's infinitely better than anything else in this world. I mean, of all people, we as Christians can face death with the truth knowing what's on the other side for us. And it's not scary. Dying is scary, but death itself, being on the other side, is not. We get to hear the voice of God. So I think the heart can be made glad in the house of mourning, not by ignoring death, but actually by having the heart reinvigorated sort of with a vibrant, biblical, and healthy, eternal perspective on death, with the fact that there is an afterlife and that we have something to look forward to as people. So in this way, we're not just people who like to think positively about death when there's no reason to. We have every reason to think positively about death. You know, the passage that we just read and we're going to study today talks about actually two major troubles that are really common to everyone here in life. One here who have a family who is grappling with death. If you have family, chances are you're going to have to bury someone here and you will experience this too. And the second one is you have the experience of a woman who is basically amongst the living dead, right? So you have a dead family member and a woman who is functionally living the living dead to her society, a societal outcast. But what Matthew wants us to see and what I want us to see as well through this is that there's a theme that's running all throughout his gospel and it shows up right here. And this theme is that the mighty power of the kingdom of God that has come in the person of Jesus Christ is not just only broken into this world, 
but it is going to win. It's going to take over everything, and it's going to completely undo the curse of sin and right all the wrongs in this world and set things straight once and for all. You know, all throughout Matthew's gospel, you read about the kingdom of God. It's the number one theme. When Jesus begins preaching, his ministry is repent. The kingdom of God is here. He calls his disciples to go and to preach about the kingdom. And you see, basically, through his ministry, as the demons run away in horror, as the lepers are cured, as the uh, forces of nature actually bow to Jesus as king and the wind and the seas obey him, as other demons, you know, meet with him, they start screaming and shrieking and saying, you are the son of God, and they just get out of his way. You realize that the kingdom of darkness's days are numbered and has no chance against the kingdom of Christ. See, the new world order has arrived in the person of Jesus Christ, and that's what Matthew wants us to see. See, the, new, the kingdom, just as Mike was preaching about last week, is like new wine. And wine throughout the Old Testament, you know, is a symbol of the party or the feast, this image of this great messianic kingdom of table fellowship with God. And Jesus said, that's what the kingdom of God is going to be like. You don't bring wine to a funeral and say, hey guys, like, who wants a little pick me up here, you know, as we, uh, as we look at this casket, right? No, no, you bring wine, right, to a feast or to a party, and the point of this earlier section that Mike had preached on about is that the kingdom of God is like new wine. And it's got to be poured into new wineskins. New types of people who are ready to receive the truths about the kingdom of God and who are going to celebrate the joys of the kingdom. Yes, the demons are going to run from now on. Diseases days are numbered. These are exciting times. And right here in this chapter Uh, As we look at it over the next three weeks, we're going to see three markers of this kingdom of just different types of healing that are going to take place. Two are going to be the the, the ladies today. There's two blind men afterwards, and then there's a mute person. All this to say, Matthew is just emphasizing that the newness, the newness of the kingdom of God as it comes in its full power. You know, here, actually, we've been building up to something as we see Jesus' triumphs over nature, his triumphs over illnesses, his triumphs over the demonic. Right here, we're at the pinnacle of, of, of this section of Matthew, as we see Jesus not only in all of his, uh, his, as we see Jesus not in his divine glory that he had, that we will see in Revelation, but we see actually in the, in the peak of his power, as he actually raises someone from the dead. First time that we see this, all the miracles up to this point are leading to this ultimate climax of this resurrection from the dead. But as we read the rest of Matthew's gospel, we're going to see that this climax of resurrection is also pointing forward to, as we know, the ultimate resurrection and that his, his defeat of death for all time, for all eternity, right? Jesus Christ has the power to raise a little girl from the dead because he has the power to take up his own life and to lay it down. But let's go back through this verse by verse. And I want to point out a number of things here in our text for us here. Let's reread verses 18 to 19, okay? Verse 18, it says, While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. Now, now, it's interesting in this text, it's not specified here, but it says here that a ruler came to meet with Jesus. If you look at the parallel text in the book of Mark and Luke, we find out a bit more about this ruler. Two things, actually. One is that his name was Jairus, and second is that he was actually a ruler of the synagogue. In other words, he was quite an important person in the Israelite society as he helped to manage the affairs of the synagogue, you know, and he was a leader, part of the religious establishment of the day. In other words, though, of course, is he belonged to an establishment that was growing increasingly hostile to this upstart Jesus who was advocating different ways, it seems, of worship, and they didn't really know what to make of him. Here we find, though, this Jairus, this ruler of the synagogue, though, he's in trouble. And the text tells us, actually, that despite probably the misgivings of his friends and his fellow colleagues, he's desperate. And it says here in the text that he actually comes and he kneels before Jesus. Though, of course, he's Jesus' superior in society, he comes to Jesus not in a demanding way, but in humility, knowing that he has to beg. And Luke tells us, and Mark also tells us about his desperation as well. And we get a bit of a hint about why he was so desperate. You know, Luke actually tells us that the girl who was sick was 12 years old, and not only that, she was his only daughter. I mean, this is probably the daddy's girl. I mean, this is his precious one and only daughter. 
And you can just imagine his desperation, thinking at this baby girl who he wants to protect and wants to care for, absolutely sick. Whatever misgivings he might have had with Jesus or whatever, all that goes out the window. He looks at life and death, his only child, and he says, everything's out the window right now. I need help to deal with this crisis in my life. You know, I'm a father to three girls as well, and there's anything that I want to do, I want to protect my baby girls as well. It's just, just instinctive, you know? You want to hold them close. You do anything for them to defend them and protect them. I can't imagine, you're just reading this as a father, what kind of anguish he must have felt as he threw himself on the floor begging Jesus. You know, Luke tells us that he implored Jesus. He begged him earnestly, speaking, please come and help me. There's no pride left here whatsoever. All humility and desperation. And you see how tender the Lord Jesus Christ is. Just immediately the text says he just goes, he follows Jairus at his request and he goes. You know, I think it's a lesson for us, you know, as painful as this passage is, isn't this often God's way in dealing with people? Doesn't God often take from us in an instant what we value so much and cherish just to show us our need for him? Many of us, if we are willing to admit it, never came to God because we were like, you know, life is so good right now and I was just doing some thinking about God and I was wrestling with things and I think I really should think about Christianity. To be honest, the way that most people come to Christianity is like, uh, I lost my job, I was crippled, I got cancer, my boyfriend left me or something. And you come to God and you say, I've tried everything else and, uh, and, and you're the last thing as well. Maybe you can help me. And you know, God, is, and God never turns us on and says, well, fine, you came right now, you know, thanks, you know, you really waited a long time. He never treats us like that. It's remarkable that, you know, we often turn to God in the midst of our pain and yet in his kindness and his tenderness, he does not throw us out and he works with us. That's how I came to Christ. God is kind enough to take away from people what they cherish so much so that they might be able to see him. I think this is really important for us to understand about the meaning of pain. Instead of just running away from pain in our lives, we really should stop if you're thinking and saying, are you trying to get my attention? Is there a lesson for me to learn here? You know, I remember watching a show called 60 Minutes. Maybe some of you uh, watch document. I like documentaries. You know, I like learning about interesting things. And there was a, in this documentary, a girl who was diagnosed with, uh, with something called CIP, which is congenital insensitivity to pain. I didn't know about this before, but it's actually a rare disease in which people don't really feel pain. Now, you might think that's an amazing thing because that would make you like a superhero, but it's actually a very, very dangerous thing. In fact, in that documentary, their little girl, uh, they, they figured out really young that, you know, she couldn't feel pain because she would actually begin to bite her tongue and her fingers and she would bite them and she said they would look like raw pieces of meat afterwards. The, the concern for my parents was so great that in consultation with the doctors, they felt that the only way to save her was actually to do a dentist procedure and to remove all of her teeth. And so they took all the teeth out of her mouth just to save her life. And her mother, in that documentary, you can see her weeping and declaring, and she emotionally says, I would give anything for my child to be able to feel pain. Now, you, you, you stop and you think about that. Can you imagine what it takes for a mother to have to say something like that? You think about us in our lives. Like I know many of us would say, I only want successes in life. How many of us actually want pain in life? You know what the truth of the matter is? Is that... Um, you know, if you only had successes in life and you never failed and everything you touched did well, like, you know, you had the Midas touch and everything you touched just turned to gold and you can make millions of dollars, I am, I'm willing to bet that just based off my interaction with people in this world, that most likely, if you succeeded at everything that you did, you would be a very unbearable person to be with. You'd be probably self-centered, highly narcissistic. You wouldn't even ask other people for their opinions. You would just simply say, I win at everything that I do. You should just listen to me. Why even bother to have a conversation? If you did not have pain, if you did not have failure, if you did not have setbacks in your life, you would never learn. You would never see a need to learn, nor would you ever think that you would need correction in your life. Logically speaking, pain in your life is actually good, especially if God brings it to you because he is showing you through pain, using a megaphone to shout into your life and say, something is wrong. And that needs to change. And I'm getting your attention here. You need to listen to me because I'm speaking to you in a way that you will understand. Pain tells us, take your hand off of the hot stove because that is not good for you. Put it here instead where you're going to find life. Right? That's what God wants from us in the midst of pain. See, Jairus' fellow synagogue leaders couldn't help him. Doctors couldn't help him at this time. His status couldn't help him. Nobody could help him. 
And in this place, all the things that he had once counted on, all the things in his social circle are useless, and only Jesus can help. And this is often how God works, driving people to a place in their life where they have nothing else that works except for Jesus. I think that praying grandmothers, as I've seen over and over again in youth ministry, are one of the greatest youth workers. It's terrifying to actually meet these wayward kids who are living like the devil as well, and then they have this praying grandmother on the side who refuses to quit giving up on them, and I just think to myself sometimes, looking at them, I think, you don't have a chance. You don't have a chance. You know, your siblings all got saved as well because of this praying grandmother. You know, God has his way of doing things in people's lives. He works where we cannot. Now, Jesus, of course, goes very quickly, you know I mean, with Jairus, as I said, and he's working in Jairus' life to do something to him. But on the way, there's a little interruption, but it's not, a, it's, it's not an interruption that takes God by surprise. It's so strategic. Verses 20 to 22. Let's read it again. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I touch his garment, I will be made well. And Jesus turned and seeing her said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. Now, this, this incident is another incident of, of healing here. And it's hard to know exactly what this discharge of blood was, but we kind of have a hint for it because the word that's used here to describe the bleeding is also found in Leviticus chapter 15, just one other place in the Bible. And it's in the context of a woman having her menstrual cycle. And so according to the Old Testament law, which was very concerned, you know, with um, cleanness, uncleanness, about ritual purity, what you had to do, what you had to wear in order to be able to come before God, how you had to wash yourself, you know, all these things about ritual cleanliness in the Old Testament were meant to signal to the people that when you approach God, you need to approach him on his terms. Don't just show up any, however you want. Show up, of course, with your heart, but the outward dress, the things that you do, the way that you wash, the way that you prepare yourself is to remind you that God is a holy God and that you should stand in reverent awe of him when you meet with him. Now, in this case, of course, one of the things that did not allow a woman to be able to go into the temple to worship at the time was if she was on her period, right? Or there was a discharge. Same thing for a man. If a man had a uh, uh, like bleeding or a discharge or other things, he also couldn't go in. Also, it tells us in verses 20 to 24 of Leviticus that not only that, anything that the woman in this particular time would touch would be classified as ceremonially unclean. And this also went for anything else or any one the woman touched. So if she touched a person, they would also be unclean until the evening and they couldn't go into worship, right? Now, just as a reminder, I'm saying this isn't a statement about a person's moral life. If you were in a state of uncleanliness in the Old Testament, it didn't mean that you were immoral, right? It was just an outward reminder to people about the holy nature of God. There were rituals and things that they had to go through, okay? Now, the problem, of course, in this text is that right here, Matthew tells us that this woman had this issue of blood for 12 years. And Leviticus tells us that as long as you have this kind of illness, you can't actually come in and to worship. So the truth of the matter is here, this woman would have been a societal outcast, unable to have basic things like hugs from other people because she would render them unclean, unable to go into the temple. She would not be able actually to share things, utensils with other people because she would make them unclean. She wouldn't even be able to sit on the same bench as another person lest she make that unclean and, and make the other person unclean. Essentially, this is a societal death sentence, okay? Like, you can read about this. Like, if you think this is crazy, you can actually read. The rabbis and the Jews had a writing of the time called uh, the Mishnah uh, Zavim, which is actually a whole tractate, five chapters of this stuff, explaining in, in minute detail of what you can do, what makes things clean and unclean. It gets so crazy. Like, it applies to men as well. So an individual who is defiled, who is called a Zav, has many restrictions. So I'll just, I'll give you an example about how pedantic they were at this point. In chapter 3, verse 3 of it, it states that if a person sat on a bench that is firmly secured, like on a large boat, and that movement does not cause the bench to move, then another person can share the seat with them. The reason being is that if you were to rock the seat, the seat would not move, and therefore you would not be responsible for moving the other person and therefore touching them by proxy through another thing. So therefore, it would be permitted to sit on a long bench that is securely fastened against something else. However, if the bench wobbles, whatever, you are classified as indirectly moving the person and you render them ceremonially unclean, okay? 
So, I mean, they have all kinds of things like this, and it applies to boats. There's issues about trees, you know? What you can do is how wobbly is the bed. You know, there's so many of these things, but they were really serious about this stuff. Like, if you think about it in modern terms, you think that putting on a mask and figuring out where to take it on and off, you know, in our society is bad? Just try this. Imagine coming to the church and saying, oh, I can't touch the doorknob. Would you please open it for me? And you come into the church and you say, Westland Baptist, do you guys have pews here? Because you have these seats that actually, if I were to accidentally shake them, I would render the person next to me unclean and they actually can't worship here anymore. So I can only sit in a pew that's fixed to the ground. I mean, just think of the nightmares that this would cause. Going to the grocery store, trying to worship. Needless to say, this woman was isolated by the nature of all these restrictions. You, you think that government restrictions now are bad. Just think of these religious restrictions that people lived under at the time. Her life was essentially living death, away from everyone, cut off from the life of this world. Luke tells us, furthermore, that not only was she socially destitute, but she was financially destitute as well, as it says here that she spent all of her money on living on physicians, but they could not heal her. I mean, at least if she could have died, she could have ended some of her suffering, but her condition is not life-threatening. It's just life-sucking instead. Horrid. No money. No friends. Maybe some of you can actually relate to that, what that's like. You know what depression is like? Feeling like you don't have friends? All the things that you have just don't work out for you? Where's the end in sight? Some of you actually live here with chronic pain you know, or emotional trauma, and you know exactly what this is like. Things don't seem to improve year after year. Does anybody see, does anyone understand me? Nothing has been able to help, but what about Jesus? You know, the text says here, she hears about Jesus and she comes up behind him. She knows what's at stake here. She knows that she doesn't deserve to be around anyone else. She could make people in a crowd unclean. If she touches him, you know, what if she makes him unclean as well? But she's so desperate to be healed of this. She says, he's a holy man. If only I just touch, touch the fringe of his garment, just a little part of him. With him being who he is, I will be healed. And she does it, she touches it. Luke tells us that the power flows out of Jesus. It cleanses her completely. And instead of her defiling him like everything else that she touches in her life, people running away from her, instead Jesus turns to her instead. And he speaks kindly to her. I mean, this would have taken immense faith and courage. And Jesus isn't offended. He actually looks at her and he says, take heart. Don't be afraid. And then he calls her daughter. You imagine how sweet this must be to her ears. I mean, it's family language. You know, when you go through all the Gospels, nobody else, no other woman that Jesus addressed is ever called daughter. Only this woman. He speaks to her in the language of a family. I think he instantly knows, right? Of course, this is a woman who has put faith in him, and that's why she is healed. You know, she, 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 you know, he's never seen her in his life, but she is of the family of faith. She's like Abraham, the father of our faith. And he looks at her and says, you are relationally close to me now because you know who I am. You trust me and you put your faith in me. You are my daughter. She has great faith and her great faith is simply rewarded. Now, now it says here in our text, of course, that Jesus says, your faith has made you well. But you know, I, I think the ESV is often very good. But in this place, I, I feel like they just kind of obscure it. If you want to know literally what it says, actually, it's the word sozo in here. Actually, Jesus says, your faith actually has saved you. Now, there's two meanings for the word sozo in the New Testament, right? One is there's sozo in that, like, you can save someone, you know, from physical harm. You can save them, you know, from an illness or so. But it also is the same word that's used to describe salvation. And when Jesus speaks this way, I think it's actually intentional. He literally says, your faith has saved you. Now, the question is, what does it mean? Does it mean physical? Does it mean spiritual? I think it's both. I think there's a double entendre going on here. And Jesus is trying to say, like, I know you came to me for physical healing, but you would never have gotten the physical healing if you didn't spiritually believe in who I was. And you know, and you have been rewarded for it. It was faith. She saw rightly with the eyes of faith, and she reached out to him, and she had healing. See, if you want healing in your life, here's the lesson. You've got to have faith. You want to fix the problems in your life? You can't fix them on your own. Look to God for the problems which are too big for you to solve and say, I can't do it. I need you. See, if you meet the real Jesus and you see him for who he is, you will never be the same if you come with faith. 
and you will be changed and different. And whether that comes off in physical healing, not always, but sometimes it does, you will be spiritually different, transformed, right? Two people already that are, are, are transformed in this passage, a girl and this woman. Now let's hop back to the girl in 23 to 26, okay? The text says, and when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away for the girl is not dead but sleeping and they laughed at him. But when the crowds had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand and the girl arose. And the report of this went out throughout all that district. Now, now the text says here that there's, there's a commotion basically when Jesus arrives at the house and this is a big like uproar in a scene. And you have to understand that in, the, in their world, they usually buried within 24 hours. And so as soon as the girl is dead, guess who shows up, right? Family, friends, they're all mourning. But also you have these flute players as well. Now, one thing that if you've been in Western funerals, you know that Western funerals are generally quite quiet. People file in, they sit together, there's some tears, you know, shedding, and people struggle to read their speeches. It's orderly. Everyone, you know, is polite. Uh, they go and they pay their last respects and they file out. If you come from another culture and you have seen funerals in other places, like an Asian funeral other places, or a funeral in Africa, you will know that the way that people traditionally mourn can be quite different. Uh, I've been to Asian funerals as well, and they can be frightening as well, with people screaming. And in some cases, they hire what are called professional mourners, actually, to cry. Their job, actually, believe it or not, is actually they are paid to go to funeral to funeral and to make noise and to wail and to cry. And sometimes they play instruments as well. And although it may seem strange to us in the Western world, this was a common thing in the Middle East and is still common in other parts of the world. The idea being that is if you are a family member and you want to show that you really love the person that has passed away, you will express that outwardly. So this North American thing that we do is very, very odd of being very quiet. But the point here is that the flute players show up, show that there is probably a group of professional mourners that are ready here, ready to carry out their duties. You know, there's a, in the Midrash, uh, Ketubah, it says that even the poorest Jewish families are expected to hire, quote, not less than two pipers and one wailing woman. So if you are a Jew at the time, this is what you had to do. Set aside money, not just for the casket, you know, but set aside money for flute players and the wailing woman. When Jesus shows up to this scene, he says, this is nonsense. Just get out of here. The word says that the crowd was put outside. It's actually a strong word, ekbala. It's like he kind of like ushered them out, threw them out, so stop making noise. In fact, he actually speaks to them and says, she's not dead, she's sleeping. And when they hear that, they laugh. I mean, they're like, Jesus, we've heard of your reputation probably, you know, of a great teacher and so on. I know you can heal people of illnesses, but do you know dead is dead and there's nothing that you can do about it. And even though they're on the brink of miracle, they don't realize who he is and what he's about to do. And they scoff at him. I feel that's a lot like what people do today when they work with Jesus. The reaction of the crowd is the same as many 21st century Canadians today. When they encounter the promises of God, they meet with Christians who talk about the validity of Jesus. Talking about his resurrection, they think, that's kind of odd. Well, you know, I'm glad that Jesus is a good teacher in your mind. He can do all these things and he's made you happy and so, but son of God who can resurrect himself from the dead and can do all these things, that's just too much, you know. Uh, who are you trying to kid? You realize that the way that 21st century North Americans react to Jesus is exactly the same way as the crowd. We'll acknowledge you as a teacher. We'll acknowledge you as an individual who can do great things. But when it comes to real problems like death and stuff, there's no solution actually for that. I need something else. And so they totally miss it. And they don't actually get to see the resurrection. But what does Jesus do? He walks right in there. He takes the girl by the hand. Luke and Mark give us a fuller account of this. He looks at the little girl and says, Talita kumi. And the little girl rises, takes in a breath. She sits up. Her father and mother standing there are absolutely amazed, along with the three disciples as well. And Jesus says, give her something to eat. And then he goes out. Don't tell anybody too much about this kind of stuff, but the report spreads anyways. It's a fantastic scene. Here they are, parents, looking at the worst possible thing, burying your child, you know. And Jesus, the Lord of life himself, walks in and does for them the first miracle, the first resurrection that we see in the book of Matthew and says, I give you your daughter back. I know you would give anything in the world for it, but I do it because I am God. God in human flesh, whom the winds and the seas obey, right? Who is this man is the question of Matthew. And the answer that Matthew gives us in this short little account is he is none other than God himself. You know, Matthew's account is short compared to Mark's and Luke's, right? 
It's different because Matthew had a different purpose in writing. Mark and Luke kind of expand things out. You see the grief of the father. You see the family, right? You can see in detail the woman as she trembles, right, having touched Jesus. You get all these other eyewitness details that show the incredible tenderness and the compassion of Jesus. And it's important to read Mark and Luke for what they're trying to say. But Matthew has a very specific purpose for writing such a short account. He leaves out all those details because Matthew is concerned about one thing. He just wants us to see this is the king. And when the king walks onto the scene, whether your problems are being a societal outcast, whether you are financially destitute, or whether you are looking at death in the face, in the face, the king has a solution to your problems. Period. You know, friends, as we as we wrap this up, you know, there's there's two lessons I think that I want to draw from this. Do, do you see the two parallels from these two extremes here? See, you might be sitting here today with a life that has been largely good. 12 years of goodness, just like Jairus did. I mean, I love playing with my kids. They're just so funny. You know, I was just laughing at the things that they say. My daughter was teaching them about um, expressions, and you know, trying to teach them these, these expressions. She comes in and says, we need to stop this cold chicken. I'm like, cold chicken? I'm like, where did, you mean cold turkey? I'm like, yes, cold turkey. I'm like, wrong animals, right? But you're pretty close, right? You know, it's just such a delight to work with children and the things that they say. I can imagine Jairus, you know, raising this little girl, right, up to 12 years old before her bat mitzvah. She's not a young woman yet, just about to enter into the flower of her womanhood. And then all of a sudden, this little girl is taken away from him, the delight of his eyes. This, you know, as a father, I just, you know, I just think about that, and I, I've seen this, you know, in people's lives, right? It's hard to look at and to think, maybe that's you, you know. You're sitting here, right, today, and you feel like life has been really good, actually, for things, but then all of a sudden, things have just come to a crashing halt. You don't know what to do with yourself now. Or perhaps you're on the other side, right, the other extreme, which is the woman's case. She hasn't had 12 years of happiness, but the text says she's had 12 years of absolute misery. Her life has been lived entirely in the shadow. And here, in the midst of her grief, she looks forward for for relief for her pain, and she sees the one thing, the same thing that Jairus sees as well, and that is Jesus. See, and whether that's absolute tragedy that's hit you unexpectedly, or whether that's 12 years of suffering, or 25 years of suffering, the answer is the same. Turn to Jesus Christ, because he alone can actually heal you. And if you're in that spectrum, anywhere between these two extremes, the Son of God has something for you as well. You, let, me, let me be very clear, though, here, that I don't think this passage is teaching that always, if you come to Jesus, that all the problems that you have in your life necessarily go away, okay? You need to understand this, right? That Jairus' daughter, as well, eventually did die. This woman eventually did die. She had a temporary resurrection. And for every person that was healed like this that Jesus encountered, there were a thousand other people in the Roman Empire or in Palestine who died every day and did not get treated by him and suffered even though they were faithful. See, I'm certain that they, others experienced they experience hardships, life, suffering, and yet at the same time, we as Christians know we are going to go through these things as well. But the joy that we have as Christians is as we look at that text is even though that little girl will one day grow up and die again, and that woman, though she was cured of her illness, maybe she developed cancer later in life and she died at a ripe old age, the point is ultimately her faith was in Jesus. And because her faith was in Jesus, her eternal life was secure. So for us as Christians, whether or not God deals with our immediate problems, we know that he has done us a great thing and that our souls are safe and they are secure. Whether or not God heals you of your cancer today or whether you die of it and you are not sitting here in one year from today in this church anymore and I don't get to see you, I know that if you trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, I will see you again. I will see you in glory, healthy, and your prayers will ultimately have been answered. You know, I saw a clip from the extended edition of The Lord of the Rings. Um, I, I find it difficult to watch movies as well because I'm too impatient, so I just rather read books and I read summaries of them, but I had to see this thing because people have talked about it. It's a famous clip apparently of King Theoden as he's burying his son in the extended edition, and he's grieving there and he says a line, no parent should have to bury their own child. And it's so true, right? You know, you call a child who loses parents an, an orphan, and you call a woman who loses her husband a widow, but what do you call person who loses their child. There's actually no word for it in the English language. Seems so appropriate because there's really no word to describe that level of pain that you feel. Now, I remember four and a half years ago hearing news of 
another miscarriage that we had. I remember when I got the news about the bleeding and all this thing, I just lay on the floor and I cried, begging God, said, please God, spare the life of my child. Give this child life, you know. I know you can do miracles. Defend my child, please, Father. I remember just praying. I mean, our child died. Esther and I cried together. It wasn't the first time. I remember later as I was driven to the Lord and I began writing in my diary, thinking about things. I wrote the word that we had lost our baby and it just didn't seem so appropriate. So I sat there and I pulled back from it and I thought for a while and I said, why don't I like, why don't I like this word? And I wrote in my diary, like, I don't like this word because I feel like it implied some sort of negligence or inability on our part to catch this child. You know what I mean? It caused the death of this child. You know, nothing could be farther from the truth. One is, we didn't lose anything. It wasn't our mistake. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away and the child is lent to us from the Lord as long as that child lives, you know. And the second part about lostness is, lost means that you are in a place where you don't know where you are. And the truth of that matter is, if I believe the scripture and I believe about Jesus, that child today is not lost. That child is found. That child lives in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That child is in a place that is secure today, dwelling with Jesus, and one day I will get to see that child again. You know, I like to tell people, you know, for those who are willing to hear and it's not too weird and, I, and people are willing to talk seriously with me, they ask me, like, how many kids do you have? Well, what's your family said? And I often tell them I'm actually a father of six. I have four who are here with me today and two who are waiting for me in heaven. And one day I'll get to see them. I look forward to the day, you know, of hearing those sweet words from my children as they're growing up and they can say to me, Daddy, it's me. It's me, you know. I think about, you know, the children. I've grown up with Jesus and I'll have the best family reunion that we will ever have had. All of us will finally be complete and together for the first time. You know, as much as I love my family and my children right now, we always know, we, my, we talk about if our kids, our family is not complete, but one day we will be. If we're all believers in Jesus, we'll all see each other there in heaven around the table of the King of Kings. We'll play Dutch Blitz in heaven. We'll enjoy all the things that we enjoy doing as a full family of eight once again, plus all these other brothers and sisters. And I will share with them the stories about Westland Baptist Church about those of us who fought for the Christian gospel, who worked to save people for Jesus, who went out into the communities and proclaimed Jesus to a world that is desperately dying and needs to know him. I mean, I know many of you have been with me for years. I'll introduce them to like Uncle Yuji, who saw the birth of my first son, Nathan, way back when I was at Willington. I'll introduce them to like Auntie Eva and, and Uncle Damien as well, who cried and prayed with us as we miscarried. You know, I'll introduce them to all of you guys as well, you know what I mean, who are with us and went to sports camp, worked through the coronavirus pandemic and, and talk to them as they're wide-eyed and they listen to stories of redemption as we sit at the table together. That's be the best dinner conversations I will ever have with a family. And I look at my children and I often think I never gave them a name, you know what I mean? But I'll ask them, I said, what is the special name that Jesus gave you that the scriptures say that is known only to him. What is it? My children have names and they wait for me there. I am not sorry that I have passed through pain, death. I am not sorry that I'm a pastor and I bear burdens and I see death all the time. In fact, though, I think I am a privileged person because day after day, as I read my Bible and as I work with the people of God in their sufferings, I am privileged to have a front row seat all the time to the glories of God and a reminder that this world is not my home and I am passing through this place. And I would take as many people, calling them from the precipice and the brink of sin and death to know the Savior who is my God. Friends, you know, this story addresses these two huge questions in life. Do you have something to sustain you when everything goes wrong? or if everything has been going wrong for all the time, have you found what you're looking for, the only one who can make it and teach you and save you from your sins and to make all things right? Now I'll close with a quote that I heard from the sermon from John MacArthur but I think a Canadian author, G.B. Hardy. He wrote, when I looked at religion, I said I have two questions. One, has anybody ever conquered death? And two, if they did, did they make a way for me to conquer death? I checked the tomb of the Buddha and he was occupied. And I checked the tomb of Confucius, and it was occupied. I checked the tomb of Muhammad, and it was occupied. And I came to the tomb of Jesus, and it was empty. And I said, there is one who conquered death, 
And I asked the second question, did he make a way for me to do it? And I opened the Bible and discovered that he said, because I live, you also shall live. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 